Okay. Hello and welcome again to the Patent Literacy Symposium. And this is the session, If We're So Right, Why Do So Many People Think We're Wrong? My name is Karen Brady and I am joined by my colleague Jen Jennifer Alicondri. And we are excited to facilitate this session for everyone. So just a few housekeeping items before this session starts. Handouts for this session or at the Patent Literacy Symposium are housed on Schoology and the session handouts for this session will be in the folder uh, for today, but those handouts will be available tomorrow. The chat feature will be off between participants, but you will be able to chat with me if you have any needs. The session will be 75 minutes long and it is being recorded. Please keep your video feature off and mute yourself to eliminate any potential distractions to the presentation. The presenter has requested that um, he would take questions um, during the chat um, through the chat button at predetermined times. So there'll be times where um, Dr. Dykstra does stop and we'll take some questions. We would love for you to tweet out for um, and share on social media for all of us to learn about what you're learning in the symposium. The hashtag for the Patent Literacy Symposium is hashtag PA Lit Symposium 2020. And that's also in our background, our virtual background that you see here. And I would now like to introduce to you our presenter, Dr. Steve Dykstra, and I will read his bio. Dr. Dykstra is a licensed psychologist from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he works in the public sector where he specializes in trauma and severe mental health needs of children. After renewing an interest in literacy and how we teach children to read about 15 years ago, he helped found the Wisconsin Reading Association and has served on a number of state panels and commissions. He is now an advisor to CORE Learning and the International Federation for Effective Reading Instruction, a board member of the Reading League Wisconsin a regular presenter at national and regional conferences where he is known for his bow ties. Never one to shy away from controversy, his bold style can be both refreshing and challenging exactly as intended. So coming to you now from his living room in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, we have Dr. Steve Dykstra. Welcome. In, in my mind, you're all cheering for me. Um, this is one of the odd things about the, you know, as we do these things during the quarantine, during the pandemic, um, you wouldn't all re fit in my uh, living room. So I'm glad to be able to be here safe and you're safe wherever you are and we don't expose ourselves to any unnecessary risk. But we can still get together and I can still hear this information about which I'm so passionate. I want to share one little error in my bio that I put in there. It was just as I was typing along, I used the wrong word. I'm not a founding member of the Wisconsin Reading Association. To the best of my knowledge, there is no Wisconsin Reading Association. I'm a founder of the Wisconsin Reading Coalition. There is a Wisconsin State Reading Association, which is a branch of the ILA. I'm definitely not a founder of that, and if I went to one of their meetings, there's a chance I would not get out alive. Um, so they know me, but they don't feel the same about me as some other people, and that's fine. The title of the presentation today, if we're so right, why do so many people think we're wrong? The interesting thing about that title is it cuts both ways. You could do the, it would, the content of the pre presentation would be different. The points you would make would be different. What you would hold up as your best evidence would be different. But both sides could say this about the other side. Why don't you get it? Why don't you understand? Can't you see how right we are? I can't believe you don't get it the way I do. I can't believe you don't see the world and the facts and the reality exactly the same way I do. And there is that passion when it comes to reading and for all things children, but it has become unusually difficult when we talk about reading and teaching children to read, hence this phrase, the reading wars. So I decided to start out by telling you something about me. First of all, you'll notice in my, bi my biography I don't claim to be a reading teacher. I've never taught anybody to read. I know quite a bit about teaching reading. Uh, I know quite a bit about the science of reading. I really know quite a bit about what's untrue about the science of reading. And I've become noted for my uh, ability and my willingness to dissect and, shall we say, kill off the arguments of other people 
um, more so than make uh, than actually teach children how to read. Teaching children to read is very, very complicated. It's very, very difficult. It takes a long time to really get good at it. That's not something that I do. I do other things with children. I hope that doesn't detract from my, uh, in your mind anyway, detract from my uh, authority as I speak with you. I would point out, um, most drugs are developed by people who are not licensed to prescribe drugs. Surgical techniques and surgical equipment is developed by people who can't do surgery. Um, and uh, people develop and contribute all the time to things that, that are gonna be used by people that person doing the development, they don't actually do it. They don't get to that level, but they're an expert at a different level and that's how I see myself. So I wanna tell you about a conversation. I'm fairly, I'm fairly active on social media. I was posting on a, on a Facebook page um, and I got into a conversation with people. I get into a lot of conversations with people. And many of those conversations have lots of watchers. People are watching because they're waiting to see what I'm going to say. They're waiting to see what's going to come up. I have lots of people commenting back to me on the side. Good one. Ooh, that's really good. Can you give me, can I use that? Can I repeat that someplace? Um, and I was having what I considered, for me anyway, a very polite discussion with a woman trying to help her understand that what she believed about reading and how reading developed and what the facts and the science said about reading is just wrong. Not from a purely scientific factual point of view, there's no question that it was wrong. She might debate that, other people might debate that, and I would debate that forever, and I'm right, so there you go. Um, but somebody else commented to me on the side. They sent me a private message that really stuck with me. And this is what she said. She said, I know you're right, but it seems like you're calling me stupid and I don't like it. And it really caught my attention because I was working really hard to not make people feel bad. And part of what this reminded me was, it's really, really difficult to tell people, to get people to accept that for five, 10, 20, or 30 years of their devoted careers, they've been wrong. It's really hard for people to accept. It's really difficult for people, particularly when the stakes are high. You know, if you were a gardener and you found out that the way you planted tulip bulbs wasn't ideal, you were planting them two inches deep and two and a half is better, that might be easy to come to grips with after 30 years. Oh, all those years I could have planted tulip bulbs deeper they would have done better. Good to know. But when we're, we're talking about raising children and helping children develop and helping children learn to read, to find out, for somebody to say to you, to try to say to you, you've been wrong all these years. The implication of that is that all those children you served would have been better off with somebody else. I don't have to say that to you. I don't have to say all those children would have been better off if you weren't their teacher. That is implied by what I'm saying. It's nested in there and there's no way to tease it out. And that is a really, really difficult thing for almost anybody to come to grips with. We have to always keep that in, my, in our mind as we're having these discussions with people. This is very personal. Nobody gets into teaching because they wanna make a million dollars. Nobody gets into teaching for any reason other than they are dedicated to children and they want children to do well. So to come to them and say, I've got bad news for you, I don't think you really did right by these children. That is the message at some level. They'll, their own mind will spin it that way. It makes this an enormously challenging task. Marketing matters. You know, so if I was doing this at a, at a live presentation, I would ask everybody to raise their hand right now. How many of you have ever bought Nike shoes? Most hands would go up. How many of you have ever eaten, even within the last year or two, anything from McDonald's? Most hands would go up. It's funny when I ask that question because a few hands go up and then people giggle and a few more hands go up. One lady in the back of the room will invariably mention, yell, only salads. You know? But hand, people will admit they sometimes do those things. Now, do you buy Nike shoes? You buy Nike shoes or some other name brand that you prefer because you have systematically studied it and can say in an objective and authoritative way, they're better than other shoes. You buy them because you just like them. These, you feel like these are your shoes. These shoes fit you. 
these shoes are my shoes. I, I'm a Nike guy. I'm an Adidas guy. I'm a Reebok guy. Did you buy McDonald's because you think McDonald's has the best food? Or is it because in the moment, right then, convenience and other factors aside, and little screaming kids and whatever else is going on, this is just the best solution for you right now. All of those things enter into it. And it's all, it reminds us that marketing matters. We've been told Nike is best. We've been told Adidas is best. We've been told that some kind of clothing or some kind of product or some kind of shampoo is better. We've been told that McDonald's is the solution to take when, you, when you're running out of time, that your kids are gonna love it, that you're gonna love it, it's gonna make you happy. They send us these messages over and over again and it's the same thing with reading. You give me messages, products have been marketed to people for decades, for all of their professional careers and it's part of why they do it. Our marketing plan we have to admit that our marketing plan, particularly for the last 20 or 30 years for the science of reading, could be summarized, and I apologize for my language, as yelling to people on a living bumper sticker, hey, dumbass. Hey, dumbass, why don't you do this? Why haven't you figured this out yet? No matter how hard we try, that's how we come across. And it's one of the reasons that we struggle to make the progress that we need to make is because there is no clear, coherent, marketing plan to present the science of reading beyond here's the science why don't you understand us and that of course was the worst marketing plan ever to not have a marketing plan you still get a marketing plan in the other side defines you in their way and that becomes your marketing plan and how does the other side define the science of reading drill and kill learn to hate books phonics worksheets still are up over the top of your head no concern, they, they tell people there's no concern for comprehension. And we were not quick enough, we were not nimble enough to push back on this. While our side and the leaders of our side were busy doing some really important science. We didn't have anybody who was systematically telling the story of the science of reading in a way that contributed to marketing, that you could put on a bumper sticker, that you could put on a button and be proud to wear. It didn't seem like you're punching somebody in the nose Come and calling them a dumbass. And the other side, which has had tremendous marketing right from the beginning and has written a, a series of social events to advance their view of how reading works, very, very skillfully and very appropriately, I would might add, this is what people do, marketed us for us in the absence of us marketing our own ideas. And they did not market us favorably. That was not their job. Their job from their position was to put us in the worst possible light. And that's what they did. And we were very slow and very ineffective and very disorganized in pushing back on that. So we are hamstrung by what I have to call the worst marketing plan ever. There was another woman I was discussing this with, discussing the science of reading with. It's this weird hobby that I have. Um, and she got around to admitting, completely accepted all of my science. I presented her with the science, I made all the arguments. She accepted it. She even accepted the hardest thing that the other side sometimes finds, um, you know, struggles to accept the most, and that is that there is no science for the three cues. And I'll talk about this in a little while. There, in fact, has never been a study that even attempted to show that teaching those other cues improved reading. The three cues, the other cues in the three, you know, syntax and, and meaning, have never been a variable in any study ever done anywhere. Phonics and the amount of phonics instruction you get has been a massive variable in a number of studies. Phonological awareness instruction has been a variable in a huge number of studies. But if you did a lit search to look for studies, and this has been admitted to me by officials from the ILA, to study to look for studies that have tried to um, determine whether teaching those other ways of identifying words improves or damages re reading achievement. Nobody's ever, ever published a study that even attempted to show that. And I talked to her about that, I conversed with her about that, and she said, oh, I believe you. I'll, I trust that that's true. I can't think of any, I trust that that's true. 
this is how, this is still how I teach. I said, tell me how you can come to that conclusion. And she said, you have to understand, I've been doing this for 30 or 35 years. I'm so experienced. I can just tell that it works. I can just tell. The fact of the matter is we all do that all the time. We're constantly relying on the seat of the pants experience we have of the world. Tell us how the world works. It takes special effort to get out of that. We're wired to rely on our immediate impression of how things are. That's how we're evolved. That's how our brains work. And it's difficult to get out of that. But this was a very dramatic example of it. Where she says, I'm so experienced. I, I don't, basically, I don't need facts or evidence. I can just tell. If we're honest, I'll do that all the time. And quite frankly, sometimes you have to do it. There isn't always going to be evidence one way or the other for everything that you do. If you have to decide whether to use, for instance, decodable text versus other more uncontrolled text, the fact of the matter is there's lots of theories of practice about what to do and when to do it, when to switch from decodable text to uncontrolled text, how long to use it, how intensively. There is no hard data to tell you which one is right. In those situations, you're going to have to rely and your experience and what feels right to you for the way that you teach. But would you be prepared if that data was developed tomorrow or the next day or a year from now or five years from now? Would you be prepared when that data came out and it said, huh, I haven't been doing it the right way. How long would it take you to change your practice? As a human being, it would probably take you a while. And the longer you had been doing it, the harder it would be for you to change. Think about that for a moment. If the really good science came around tomorrow, it said something you do isn't the best way to do it. Would you be quick to change? Or would you be a holdout for a while? Or would you be one of the last holdouts holding the battle lines against change even five, 10, or 15 years from now? We have to be honest with ourselves about that. No one can just tell. No one can just tell. You can't just tell how things work. You just can't. Nobody gathers data naturally, systematically that well. Doesn't mean that sometimes you won't get it right. Doesn't mean that what you can just tell is always wrong. But we're not nearly as good at our seat of the pants judgment about how things work as we think we are. So when Ked Goodman and Yetta Goodman and Mari Clay and Frank Smith and their way of looking, figuring out how reading worked was to sit with kids and watch them read and observe them read and think about what it is they were seeing. And they called that research and they called that data. They were believing in a skill that human beings, quite frankly, just don't have. They don't have the ability to just observe things that carefully and that systematically um, without lots of errors along the way. Let me give you an example. The orbits of the solar system. Again, show of hands, you can do it by yourself. How many of you have ever seen the sun come up and the sun go down on the same day? We've all noticed that the sun comes up in the east, the sun goes down in the west, and even the way I describe it, the sun comes up in the east, the sun goes down in the west. Every day we see, everything we see with our eyes, everything we experience with, with our body and our, our senses of the world tells us that the sun moves across the sky. We have no sense of the earth spinning. We have no sense of the earth moving beneath our feet, but we have a tr tremendous daily, rigorous, very dependable experience of seeing the sun move. We have a clear sense that we are still and the sun is moving. And for centuries, millennia, as far as we can tell, every culture and every human being on earth believed that they saw the sun moving around the earth. And so every theory of the solar system put the earth at the center and had the star, sun and the stars and the planets moving around it. Now here's a part of the story you may not know. Several hundred years ago, when scientists with telescopes doing careful math, making careful systematic observations and measurements, showed pretty clearly that was not the case. The earth was not at the center and all the sun and the stars and the celestial bodies moving around us. From our perspective, the sun was at the center we were moving around the sun, as were all the planets. That model explained what we saw in the sky better. If you don't use that model, 
you have to explain why Mars moves in one direction, then changes and goes back and starts moving in the other direction again. There's no way to explain, objects simply don't move that way. Why would Mars of all the things in the sky be the only one that moved that way? We can account for that when we put the sun at the center of the solar system. Later we learn that the, that the sun at the center of the solar system is also moving around the galaxy and that the galaxies are moving out through the universe. So there's really complex motion going on, none of which we can detect by just telling. In fact, what we can tell by just telling, by what we observe, is faulty. Even after scientists clearly showed unambiguously that the sun was at the center of the solar system, it was over 200 years before every university in Europe, as late as the 1870s, before every major university in Europe, who knows how long minor schools did it, before every major university in Europe was teaching that the sun was the center of our solar system. As late as the 1870s, universities in what are now Poland and Germany still taught that the earth was at the center of our solar system because every day you can get up and watch the sun and it's clear and every day, if you do reading recovery or you do balanced literacy or you do fountains of Pinnell, Every day, every day you can see it work. How can you tell me it's wrong? It must be right. It, I can see it. I can see it. Phrenology. Phrenology. We're going to make fun of Ohio now. As late as 1948, there was still an, a society of professional phrenologists in Ohio. 1948. Phrenology was the study of the shape of the skull and the bumps and ridges on people's skull as a way of determining their traits, characteristics, abilities, diagnosing what we would call mental health and mental illness and character disorder. People were still putting their hands on people's heads and some people were having people wear helmets that tried to smooth out certain bumps in the belief that it would ameliorate an undesirable condition that was represented by that bump. 1948. The atomic age, jet engines, people still believed in phrenology in the United States. The house tree person test. Within my lifetime, and still lingering to some extent at the start of my professional career, the most commonly administered personality test in the world of psychology and mental health was the house tree person. Here's how the house tree person was done. You gave a person, typically a child, a piece of paper and you said, draw me a house, draw me a tree, and draw me a person. Then a very wise person who depended heavily on the I can just tell theory of, of analysis, looked at the drawing and based on the size of the house, the size of the person, the size of the tree, did the tree have leaves? Could you see the house's roof? How many windows did it have? Was the door open or closed? Was the person standing next to the house or next to the tree? Would make judgments about this person's capabilities, would make judgments about this person's alleged psychological stresses, problems, diagnoses even. Books were published with examples of pictures and what they, what they proved. The fact of the matter is objective research showed and had always showed that the house tree person was, if anything, if it was worth anything, it was a halfway decent measure of artistic ability and nothing else. So kids who've been traumatized didn't draw trees any differently than kids who had not been traumatized. And the I can just tell theory was faulty. I still run into people every now and then in my professional work who, at, who try to analyze people's drawings. Not very often anymore, but at the start of my career, it was still fairly common. Racism, sexism, and every other ism. It's appropriate that we take a moment now, given everything that's going on in our country and our world, to recognize that racism, sexism, and every other ism are all versions of this I can just tell phenomena. I can just tell. And I, what I've figured out over the course of my life is that women are not as bright, black people are not as trustworthy, Latinos are, are not hard workers. Um, all these things that we think we can just tell from being around people, and we repeat them to ourselves over and over again, and we lift them up in our world we create a background, a foundation for them in our world that continues to defend those beliefs. You know, one of the effects of everybody in your school believing that whole language is the best way to teach kids to read 
is that everybody in your school will teach coding the whole language. And the only evidence you will see of successful readers ever, ever, are kids who've been taught by whole language. And you will be convinced, look, it works. Look at all these kids who can read. How can you tell me it doesn't work? But of course, there's no study. You're not doing a study that shows that the same well-matched group of kids taught a different way, that more of them would have read, would have read better, and would have read sooner if they had been taught differently. Albert Einstein, no one can just tell. So, you know, if I asked who was the smartest guy ever, who was the smartest man or woman you can think of, somebody would say Einstein. Einstein has been the answer to that question for a very, very long time. Einstein had a couple of really good years where he published five of the most important scientific papers ever. He is rightly remembered as a brilliant man. Einstein in the world of physics is what you call a relativist. He studies the motion of large things on large scales across the universe. And the major force of the universe that relativists study is gravity. It's the force that shapes the, the relative um, behavior of planets and time and space. And nobody described it more importantly and more completely than Einstein did. The opposite end of the spectrum are quantum physicists. They study things at incredibly small levels. And at incredibly small levels, quantum science, quantum physics does not agree with relative physics. The world at a very small scale is very different than it is the way we see it now. It doesn't function the same way. It doesn't have the same certainty. The forces of gravity stop working the same way. All the rules change. All the rules change. And Einstein said this, he thought he could just tell that this can't be true. Even though the math said it was true, even though the few observations they could do said it was true, Einstein said, I'm a really smart guy and I can just tell it's not true. And he spent the last 30 or 40 years of his career systematically trying to disprove quantum physics. And one of the things he did was he did some math that uncovered something that's been become known as the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. He called it spooky interaction at a dis distance. He thought this was proof that quantum physics could not be true because it predicted these things that were so bizarre and so out there and so impossible that for, if quantum physics was true, then these things were true. And since these things I can just tell can't be true, quantum physics must be wrong. Long after Einstein was dead, the technology was developed to, do, to study spooky interaction at a distance. It was all true. All of it's correct. And that aspect, even Einstein couldn't just tell. His instincts were not good enough, even about physics, even about something he understood better than almost anybody else in the world. His instincts were not good enough to overcome the facts and the data. Ignace Semmelweis. If you don't know the name of Ignace Semmelweis, you should. Ignace Semmelweis has saved, if not your life, the lives of many people around you. The world is a different place between Ignace Semmelweis. Ignace Semmelweis should be a hero. Almost nobody knows his name. Ignace Semmelweis in the 19th century, in the 1800s, was a doctor like many other doctors and nurses, working primarily in the East End of London, which was the slums for poor people, doing his best to provide health care, in particular to deliver the children of women, of poor women, living in, living in the East End. And Semmelweis knew, as many people knew, that the rate of mortality and morbidity amongst women delivering babies in the East End was terrible. Babies were dying, women were dying, they were becoming sterile due to post-operative infections. A prevailing theory of why that was, was that, well, you know, these are poor people. This is in the age of Francis Galton and eugenics and the early stages of Darwin. These are poor people. They're not the same as the rest of us. They're not as good as the rest of us. The Constitution is not as strong. If it was, they would be like us, living lives like us. And so the fact that they were dying just seemed to befit their fate. Semmelweis didn't believe that. Semmelweis wondered what it was. This, now understand, this is before the germ theory of infection. And Semmelweis very brilliantly, systematically studied what he could do to reduce the rate of infection. And he found out that if he washed his instruments, and washed his hands, and everybody working with these women when they were delivering washed their hands in chlorinated water, what we would now call a bleach solution. 
the rate of post-operative post-delivery infection went down dramatically and the severity of the infections went down by 75, 80, 90 percent. Hundreds and hundreds of women a year didn't have to die or get deathly ill. Their fertility was saved, their lives were saved, their children were not orphaned or would have to go to orphanages. This would save the community an enormous amount of money, save lots of lives and suffering. And Semmelweis presented his data, which was unassailable. He had gathered it over years, presented his data at a meeting of physicians in London, expecting to be warmly received, that they would jump up and cheer for him and immediately change their patterns of practice. These physicians, all men, and the nurses who worked with them, mostly women, now had to confront the fact that their failure to stay clean, they didn't know they needed to, but their failure to stay clean, to wash carefully, to keep the area clean as people were delivering, had cost people lives. They were not callous to that. In fact, it was just the opposite. I believe it was devastating to them. And the response to Semmelweis was to say, this cannot be true. You are a madman. Within a few years, they had driven him out of the profession, stressed him so badly that his life fell apart. They used their power as physicians to get him signed into a psychiatric facility in London, where he died once, it, once signed in, in less than a year. 10 years later, about 10 years later, Louis Pasteur discovered the germ theory of infection. People remember what Semmelweis had said, and very quietly, without too much attention, started using chlorinated water to wash hands and to wash instruments all over the east end of London. Uh, someplace in London, there is a sign and a monument and a memorial to Ignace Semmelweis. So where shall we begin? Where does this struggle between these two ways of seeing reading occur? That it is either based on letters and sounds, or is it based on meanings and words that are taken as, in as wholes? Where does this fight begin? People are often surprised to find out, as far as we can tell in the English language, this struggle begins in about 1837 in Boston, Massachusetts, it involves two giants of the world of education. Horace Mann, for whom many schools in the United States are, are named, and Thomas Gallaudet, who was a friend of Horace Mann. Thomas Gallaudet, of course, was a pioneer in the education of the deaf and hard of hearing. Horace Mann had traveled to be with Gallaudet, and Gallaudet had showed that he could teach children who had been deaf since birth to read, not well, but some. He could teach them to read, by teaching them to read from whole words, by leaving sound and phonics and phonology out of it, by not trying to match letters to sounds. After all, there were no sounds for these children to match these letters to. And Mann was so impressed by the fact that this worked for deaf children, worked to some degree for deaf children. If it could work for deaf children, surely it would work that much better for children who can hear. And he came back to Boston and implemented this this whole, world way, whole word way of learning to read through schools throughout Boston. And one of the things he and other people wrote about it is how much nicer it was to hear children reporting, re repeating whole words one after the other than individual sounds, hearing them say book rather than book, book. At least book had meaning, it was a whole word. The school sounded better, the classroom looked better, the drills were more interesting, more satisfying, they believed. That's what they could just tell. And so this took off. And because it came from Boston and Horace Mann, it had enormous influence. And that started this process by which the struggle began. You don't understand, this is the origins of the struggle we're still in today, but it is not the struggle we were in today. There was no science in this on either side. What passed for phonics instruction on the other side was absent any teaching of phonological awareness or phonemic awareness and the teaching of the pho phonics and the phonics rules was poorly done. We, we would not count it as good reading instruction. It was just the reading instruction of the day. And so this leads to what I describe as the pendulum years, a long period of time, more than 100 years, in which the pendulum swings back and forth, not all the time in the same places. Remember, this is before large-scale publishing and reading, Schools in one place are teaching something different than schools in another place. 
Um, there's no social media. Uh, there's no internet. There's no Facebook. So these movements are mostly localized. One school district is choosing to switch from phonics to whole word. At the same time, another district 30 miles away is switching from whole word to phonics, and switching back to phonics. They don't even know the other schools are doing it. Nobody has any idea. So this isn't a movement. This is a, a, a thousand different pendulums swinging across the country. It's people that try to achieve some degree of balance. You could make the argument that this is the start of the reading wars. We know from literature that some of these battles in some of these school districts were quite testy. Teachers who had spent their entire career teaching one way now being asked to teach another way. And it didn't go well in every place. So those were the pendulum years. There was little or no systematic science. There was little or no systematic science. The idea of applying science to this was quite unusual. Social sciences at that time were still giving us things like the house tree person test. There was not a lot of science being done. Um, what passed for science was not very good. And, and we had still had a very strong belief in practitioners, particularly men with beards and bow ties, um, simply declaring that something was true. And because they were the authority, they were the expert, we should all just believe them. What data there was was very, very crude. The technology had not been developed to, de to, to analyze large data sets. Most statistics we know of now, particularly the very sophisticated ones, wouldn't be developed for, for decades. Even simple statistics like chi-square and t-test just didn't, weren't developed. People who were trying to study this data were taking averages, probably not even standard deviations. And the larger the data sets got, the harder it was to calculate those things because everything had to be calculated by hand. Analysis was almost completely non-existent. The idea of statistical significance and whether something was really different or not just didn't add up. And then what happened was you didn't know that somebody else had gotten completely different results someplace else in an equally bad study. You just knew about your study and you liked your study and so you were convinced. And this is what was going on on both sides. We sometimes want to see this period of time as our side was moving towards science and the other side was just languishing and like cavemen. It's not true. Everybody was trying the best they could to make sense of a difficult, of difficult information and difficult uh, challenges. They were trying it in different ways and everybody, everybody with the exception of a handful of people were laboring under this bias of preconception that everybody was heavily biased to seeing and finding what they believed before they ever began. You know, it's like people who tried to prove that the earth was at the center of the solar system. They found ways of making measurements and looking for facts, leaving other facts and measurements out to the side, not accounting for those. But they could just look at this data right here and it would appear to prove that they were right. Many decisions were made on the basis of preference, fashion, and personal experience. Again, ver various versions of I can just tell. This is what I know. Extremely vulnerable to bias in all the isms. Extremely vulnerable to bias in all the isms. And one of the things we have to accept here is that for centuries in this country, since we started to even try to educate black children in this country, the fact that something, the fact that ways that we taught did not work well for black children were almost always assigned an explanation that it was their fault. It was because of them. It was because of some flaw in them. It was because of some deficit in them. Some flaw in their family. It's the way they're raised. They don't care about education. They're not as invested in education. I want to tell you a story that's going on with us right now here in Milwaukee. We run a psychiatric clinic to provide medication to dozens, hundreds of children who are very difficult to manage. These are very complex cases. We've been doing that for some time as part of our overall system of care. As you can imagine, our no-show rate at this clinic, these are very traumatized, complex families. Our no-show rate is exceptionally high. We understand there are lots of explanations for why families didn't show up for their appointment. But one of our explanations was always, whether we said it out loud or not, they don't really value medical care the same way other people do. They don't really value this medicine or our time the way other people do. 
And then that's at least a part of what was going on. Well, one of the things that's happened during the COVID epidemic was we couldn't operate that clinic. So we had to switch that clinic entirely to telehealth. And a clinic that used to have a 50 to 60% attendance rate, the 40 to 50% no-show rate, and we worked hard to get that down to 25 or 30%, suddenly had zero no-show. People who were allegedly not invested in their children's well-being, people who were allegedly not believers in mental health treatment, people who allegedly didn't care, couldn't be organized enough to keep up with their medication or appointments. When they didn't have to drive to a hospital, when they didn't have to take three buses to a hospital, when they didn't have to figure out who's gonna watch their kids or how they're gonna get all their kids there at one time, when they didn't have to figure out how they would afford taking a day off from work because they couldn't take vacation, they didn't have sick leave, so they could take their kid to a clinic appointment, they showed up 100% of the time. Our theory, the way we could just tell the reasons they weren't showing up, were wrong. They weren't showing up exclusively for those other reasons. People don't not read to their children because they don't value reading. They don't read to their children because they don't have time, because they're stressed with other things, because they don't have books, because they don't know how to read, because their child is going to get stuck and they don't know what to do for them. It's not because they don't value reading. It's not because they don't value education. It's because of all those other reasons. Attempts at reason and science begin. And this is where the science of reading starts to kick in. Samuel Torrey Orton and other people, Orton died in 1948. Orton, you know, from the Orton-Gillingham method of teaching reading, tries to systematize what it means to teach these children. What's really going on? What's essential to the teaching of phonics? Why can some kids learn it and some kids can't? Why do some kids learn it and it sticks? Why do other kids learn it and it seems to fall out of their head as fast as they master it? And Orton does his best, and along with his colleagues, to figure out how to teach these things in a way, teach these things in a way that they stick and work better for kids who struggle. Now I'm gonna say something controversial. He was very good for the day, but a lot of what he believed was wrong. He left out phonological awareness. He had no knowledge of it. He had no idea what phonological awareness was. It was the answer to a lot of his questions. The evidence for the multi-sensory aspect of reading that, you know, I see debates about people. Do you have kids write the letters big and do, do, should they do air writing? Should they write in sand? Should they press on a table? Should they write through shaving cream? And so the difference between sand and shaving cream is the difference between them learning to read or not learning to read. That somehow that must be it. Most kids learn to read and we don't have to draw nearly as much attention to the kinesthetic aspects of reading as we do for some kids. That the multi-sensory aspect is probably not that important to most kids learning to read, but they pick it up on their own through what Seidenberg would call statistical reading. And if you do draw their attention to it, the thing you should draw their attention to is the multi-sensory experience of where their lips, tongue, and mouth is, whether their throat is vibrating. Those are the sensations that matter the most. Those are the things we have to get them to notice. Anna Gillingham, same thing. She outlived Orton and so was around for some more advances. You know, but one of the challenges is for our side is to admit then when people say, oh, Orton Gillingham, oh, gee, it's the be all and end all. It's the solution to all our problems. What kind of OG are you talking about? Are you talking about 1948 OG? Are you talking about 1965 OG? Are you talking about the OG that goes on now? Are you talking about OG plus phonological awareness? I'm not sure that is OG. That's OG plus phonological awareness. What are you talking about? Because OG by itself only gets you so far. It is not the solution to everything. When you say, we just need to teach all kids with OG, really? Kids who learn to read well? We believe in OG, we can just tell on OG so well that we're gonna champion OG for everybody? So my daughter, when she was four years old and could already read because she had one of those magic brains, what, she was gonna have to sit through a bunch of OG lessons? Rudolf Flesch, the author of Why Johnny Can't Read, 1955. Flesch starts to identify for people in a semi-systematic way, in an attempt at reason and science, Flesch tries to identify for people 
that the consequences of neglecting phonics, not that phonics is the answer to everything, but the consequences of neglecting phonics are dire. And that there is a dramatic difference between in the rates of failure to read amongst kids who are taught to read by with enough phonics versus kids who are taught to read exclusively through whole language. Now, we didn't call it whole language at that time, we call it whole word. And understand that even kids who are taught according to whole word almost always got some phonics. Somebody in their life drew their attention to the fact that B made the bus sound. They didn't get through their life with nobody pointing those things out to them. Everybody got some degree of phonics. Computers and the discovery of phonological awareness and blending. So when computers were first developed in the 1950s, one of the things that everybody wanted to do, one of the things they thought would be easy was they were going to hook computers up to a, to a speaker and they're going to teach computers to read. You would put in words and computers would speak them back to you. And they thought this would take a very short, relatively short period of time is one of the things they wanted to do. It would impress people no end to the power of computers. And it was decades before they could get computers to do it because there was more than just recording the sounds of letters and programming the phonetic rules of the English language and programming in the words that are exceptions as one-off sight words, which was their plan. There is the question of blending, that the word bat is not bat. There's a process of blending. There's the beginning and ending in sounds. This is the way b blends into a, which blends into t. And they couldn't get computers to do it. You know, if you think about the early efforts at speech recognition and computer generated speech, they sounded terrible because it's really hard to do. So 1967 is the beginning of a post-pendulum world. And I'm going to go into three critically important studies that happened in 1967. I was alive in 1967. I turned six that year. Some of you were alive. Many of you were not. You're going to find out why 1967 is the pivotal year in all of this and how it affects even now the way people perceive and see reading. But I want to stop and offer a chance for people to ask some questions, for, to get some questions that people might have. Does anybody have any questions? Please go ahead and put them in the chat. If you don't have any substantial questions at this point, I'm going to move along because we're going to, we'll probably get some questions off what's coming next. Okay. So 1967, the most important thing to remember about 1967 is right in the heart of some of the worst years of the Vietnam War, protests on college campuses, free love, the drug culture, um, a level of protest and unrest that makes what's going on now look like nothing. Um, there's social upheaval, and this marks the end of the pendulum years because there are three studies that come out in 1967. What you see today, what you see today, now, in the world of reading, is not the pendulum swinging. The pendulum swung for 100 years. You're not seeing the pendulum swinging. You're seeing a tug of war. You're seeing a tug of war that began in 1967 and continues today. And that's good because we should have a scientific tug of war with them. And what you see today is rooted in 1967. Three critical publications come out in or around 1967. Different versions came out in different years. But there were versions of these, of these papers that all came out in 1967. The first is Learning to Read the Great Debate by Gene Chow, 1967, 372 pages. It is a tour de force, an epic piece of work in which Gene Chow reaches back into those years of, of sketchy, poor science and reason and tracks down like a detective. She tracks down the evidence, the data. She pulls from it what could be real. She applies more modern data methods and science to old crappy data, polishes it up, figures out what parts are good, what parts are bad, and pulls these things out. And much as she can, she tries not to be biased. She tries to shield herself from her bias. She gets her graduate students to work with her. She manages to accumulate enough data that seems to show unequivocally, in a more scientific way than Rudolf Flesch did, the teaching of sound symbol relationships, the phonetic, sound based approach to reading is substantially more effective than a whole word meaning based approach to reading. 
Her book is 372 pages long. It is steeped in science. It is dense. It is not something you would read before you went to bed at night. It is not light. It is the kind of book like Mark Seidenberg's book that you go back and you read pages and paragraphs and sections over and over again. You do not read this for fun. Particularly if it's going to tell you something you don't want to hear. Nobody reads this book for fun. It's enormously important, absolutely critical to the science of reading. She sifts and winnows decades of shady science. She concludes teachers do better. Teachers do better with what they know best. So a teacher who knows whole word teaching will do better teaching whole word than if we forced her to teach phonetically. But a teacher who knows phonetic instruction will do better than a teacher who knows whole word instruction. So there's a lesson in there for teacher training and preparedness. Teachers who know how to teach phonics are better than those who teach, are more effective than those who teach C, C, meaning. Chal has been misrepresented. Chal has been misrepresented more times than I can count as they take this observation about teacher knowledge and teacher training out of context and make it seem like Jean Chal said teachers should teach the way they were trained. She was saying teachers should be trained to teach this other way. And if you want them to teach this other way, you're going to need to retrain them. You can't just hand them the materials and expect them to be effective. The first grade studies. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the first grade studies. They were done by Bond and published by Bond and Dykstra for what was then the National, the Department, National Department of Education before it was a cabinet level position. I'm going to ask anybody who's read the first grade studies to raise their hand. Nobody's read the first grade studies. If you can find a copy of it, good for you. It's over a thousand pages. In some, most versions, it's over 1,200 pages. The executive summary is well over 100, like 160 pages. I've read the executive summary. It's like reading a whole book. And that's just the summary of the total, of the total study. Bond and Dykstra collected, they oversee, there are site directors at each study, 27 different projects going on at 27 different sites in 27 different ways by 20 different, 27 different investigators all though under the umbrella of the first grade studies being done all over the country, all taking different approaches to this question, what's the best way to teach young children how to read? Were social classroom and community factors important in how children learn how to read? Was there an approach that worked best? And they found that yes, those other things all mattered, but there was through all of that, much like Jean Chaw, they could figure out there was an approach that worked best. This is oftentimes presented as phonics worked better than whole word. Phonics did work better than whole word, but phonics instruction was not the most effective way of teaching reading in the first grade studies. Something they referred to as phonics plus linguistics. Phonics plus linguistics. We wouldn't say it that way now. They didn't have the words. The words were not popularly used in 1967. If they wrote the first grade studies they would do today, they would say phonics plus phonological awareness training and morphological awareness training is more effective than phonics alone. That's what they meant from the studies that touched on these other things that were very early, just barely emerging in science and the way we taught children how to read. They were much more effective than CSA meaning based and whole word approaches by far. And this was across a very diverse range of studies. Now here's the problem. They were also misrepresented, one of the problems, they were also misrepresented because they also found the teachers were most effective teaching the way they were most familiar. Here's the problem though. It was 1967. Bond and Dykstra was 1,200 pages long. If you could get a copy of it, you could barely carry it back to your dorm room. Who was gonna read this thing? Jean Charles' book was being read by linguists and scientists. It wasn't being read mostly by students of reading. If it was, it was being summarized. It was being excerpted. It was being taken out of context. But at the same time in 1967, Ken and Yetta Goodman published a, published a paper, can't call it a study, entitled Reading a Psycholinguistic Guessing Game. They had presented it previously at a conference, and now it came out in a published form. 
It was nine pages long, nine pages front to back. You can read it on a bus ride. You have to think about something else that came out around, during that period of time, Xerox machines. There were Xerox machines on campus. It was the beginning of universities and professors Xeroxing articles and handing them out to, uh, out to students. Nobody could Xerox Charles Booker, Bond and Dexter's work, but you could Xerox a psycholinguistic guessing game and hand it out to everybody. What a psycholinguistic guessing game showed it's been republished at least five times over the time. It concludes that readers do best when using contextual and other information to identify words. The problem was, and the study did show that, the problem was the study was done improperly. In the study, students were asked, subjects were asked to read a list of words and see how many they could read. Then they were asked, to read a body of text that included those words, they found that emerging readers read those words more accurately when they read them in context than when they read them in a list. And Goodman, the Goodmans concluded this was proof that emerging readers relied heavily on context to identify words. They jumped from that to conclude that all readers rely heavily on context to identify words. In fact, this was untrue. There was a design flaw in their study, which you may have noticed already. Everybody got the list first and the body of text second. So by the time you saw the words in the body of text, you had a practice effect. You had seen the words in a list just moments earlier. Now you're seeing them for the second time. Everybody reads the word better the second or third time. And yes, some kids did benefit from the context. Who benefited from context? Poor readers. Readers who couldn't decode from letters and sounds. Kids who are skilled readers, the more advanced readers, they read the words just as well in both, in, in both presentations. Give, get, get, this gave an explosive rise to the three cues in a culture on university campuses that was very prepared and very primed to throw off the shackles of the establishment, to throw off the shackles of the way everything was done already, to be convinced that our parents and grandparents and our previous teachers were all wrong, that the way we had been taught was all wrong, and they went out like little devotees and, and spread the three cues in the early days of purest whole language across the globe. Um, one of the most uh, devoted followers of Ken and Yen and Goodman uh, was in New Zealand uh, by the name of Mari Clay. But there were major design flaws that I pointed out and replications by people who believed the Goodmans. People like Keith Stanovich, who did attempted to replicate their studies and eliminate the design flaws, who expected to still get the findings of the Goodmans, realized the Goodmans were wrong. The study was never replicated and attempts to replicate it clearly showed it was incorrect, but by then it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Where you land on issues of how to teach reading is, to a large extent, determined by how you or others reacted to these three studies from 1967. Even if you have never read any of them, you learn from or are influenced by others who are influenced by others who are all connected in a direct line back to these three studies. That's what you need to know. You need to understand how this all started and how people react. There was one very poorly done study, which was nonetheless wildly influential that everybody read. There are two incredibly important studies which remain backbones of the science of reading, even to this day, fit more than 50 years later, that almost nobody read. More people read Ken and Yetta Goodman's paper in the first two years than have read the first grade studies since 1967. And this created two camps, because by the time the science of whole language was disputed, it didn't matter. It had become a movement unto itself. It was like a force of nature. Our side had Charles Adams, Motes, Torgerson, Reed Lyon, uh, Dennis Mulfee, so if you don't know him or his work, you really need to look it up. Seidenberg, Shaywitz, Airy, Wolf, many others. Our side, but the, until recently, and this is something that Seidenberg talks about, until recently, writing mostly for a scientific audience. Motes is an exception, some others are an exception. But mostly these folks were writing, where they were preaching to the choir. They were unknown. A few years ago, I sat down with some folks 
in a local school district, not in Milwaukee. We talked to them about their reading and a very defensive um, superintendent in that school district who was also a licensed reading specialist herself asked me, now when you, before you begin talking, who are the big names that you follow and you believe in? And I named these kinds of people. And she said, this is about five or six years ago, she says, I don't know any of those names. And that's not because she's a bad person. That's because she's never been exposed to those names. The pace of science is slow. This is an important thing. Science answers questions, but it answers questions slowly. You don't order the questions on Monday and get them shipped to you by Amazon on Wednesday. There is no prime for, for scientific answers. Goodman, Smith, Allington, Krashen, Clay, Fountas, Pinnell, Calkins, and many others become, and many before them, become the hallmarks, the, the standard bearers of a different way of seeing reading. That same superintendent, when we named all of those people, she knew all their names. She perked right up, oh, I know them. And I said, oh, they're wrong. And that was the end of that discussion. They're not encumbered by science. They're not, they're not writing for a scientific audience. They're writing, they're writing marketing. They're writing for their followers. They're writing for a movement. They're creating new rules and definitions of science to suit them. Yes, science says I'm wrong, but as Ken Goodman says, I have a different science. Compared to science, movements are agile and fast moving. They're less dependent on truth and reality. So they can shift, they can move, they can market, they can change things, they can change the language of what they do. When whole language became a dirty word, you just call it balanced literacy. You change it, but just a little. You say you change it a lot, but you change it as little as you possibly can. So what is this war about? Why does this war go on? We all agree on reading for meaning. Let's be very clear about that. We all agree on reading for meaning. It is sometimes said that one side believes that reading is about decoding words and the other th side believes that reading is about comprehending what you read. That's BS. Everybody believes that the end result of reading needs to be comprehension and reading for meaning. Nobody has ever believed that it's enough to be able to decode words even if you don't know what they mean. But that's something that happened when we didn't market ourselves. We got marketed by the other side, and that's what they said about us. We agree on the importance of writing. Even if so people on both sides were somewhat slow to come to that, to that realization, that it, language decoding and encoding, comprehension, are two-way streets. You have to derive meaning from words, and you have to put meaning back into words. You can't just understand what other people are saying. You have to be able to say things back to them that make sense and continue the conversation. You can't just read words off a page and understand them. You have to put meaning into your own words, put them on a page so that other people can understand you. And working both sides of that street, turning that into a continuous loop of understanding and, and literacy is absolutely important. No side really, well, both sides will claim the other side doesn't believe that. They believe it differently and they approach it differently, but I don't think there's really much difference anymore in recognizing the importance of those two things. We agree comprehension is the goal of everything. What's the point of reading if you can't comprehend? I can actually decode Spanish pretty well. I have no idea what any of it means. What's the point? We all want children to love reading. It has sometimes been said um, of people who believe in the science of reading, that, they, that if you teach children that way, they'll learn to hate reading. And that it suggests that we don't care if children hate reading. We want children to love reading. But let me be clear. I don't want children to love reading for the sake of reading, sake of loving reading. My goal is not that children should love reading. People say, I just want them all to love books. Quite frankly, I don't care if they love books. I care that they know how to read, that they love getting information, that they love learning about the world, that they love feeling their brain absorb all this information, that they love knowing themselves as a person who can read, who can understand, who can figure things out, that they see themselves as a capable person. If they don't want to curl up in, at night with a blanket under a reading lamp 
with the latest novel. I don't care. I don't do that. My wife does that. I don't do that. I read other things in other ways at other times. People would say, do you love reading? I'd say, I love being able to read. I think if I didn't know how to read, my life would really suck. But do I love reading? Like I think, oh, I just can't wait to go home and read for a couple hours. No, I can't say I've hardly ever had that thought, that impulse. We all want children to be successful. I believe that with very few exceptions, nobody in this debate is ill-motivated. Very few exceptions. I do believe there are some people on the other side who are so ashamed of their position and are so boxed in by the things they've said and done over the years that they've gotten farther and farther from this motivation. They believe they care about children. I just don't think that really enters into it. We're, for the most part, we're all sincere, particularly at the level of schools and the teachers and the people you run into and the people who are listening to me now. I don't question the sincerity of anybody. If there's somebody listening right now who deeply believes in whole language and balanced literacy, I'm not suggesting that you're lazy or stupid. You truly believe it. I know you truly believe it. I just am convinced, and I think the data supports me, that you've been misled. You've been led in the wrong direction. And we're all dedicated. Nobody's in this for the money. Very few people, with some notable exceptions, are getting rich off of this. We all work hard. But there is one great difference between these camps. Ultimately, these two camps come down to one fundamental difference, which is pervasive and does not go away. What is the thing to do when you come to a word you don't immediately recognize? What is the thing to do when you come to a word you don't immediately recognize? The answer to that question puts the differences between these two worlds in stark relief. There is a particular way of approaching that that is supported by the science of reading, is supported by advocates for the science of reading. Let me say that not every little part of that approach is rigorously supported by hard, unassailable data. Some of it is us doing the best to fill in the gaps between the data we have. The order in which we teach sounds and letters isn't written in stone. It wasn't handed down by God. But we do the best we can with it. What is clear is that there is no evidence to support other way, those other clearly different ways of doing it. That we do not figure out the word from the meaning. We figure out the meaning from the word. We identify the word first and the meaning comes next. We can see that in people's brains. The parts of your brain that identify the word are back here. I'm trying to get a license to show that there's an MRI picture of the brain reading that's done in real time, that is making a new frame every thousandth of a second, that shows the process of reading a word move across the surface of the brain. And we identify the word first by activating sound symbol relationships. And then that, is that information is transferred to the front of the brain all in about a sixth to an eighth of a second. And it unlocks the meaning of the word. It never, ever in any study has shown that a kid recognizes the meaning of the word and from that figures out the word. We have literally seen brains read. And if you, if you accept that you have to identify the word before you identify the meaning, then you can't endorse guessing, balanced literacy, and those other things. That's it, that's a disagreement. Every difference flows from how we answer that question. If you're descended from Goodman, Smith, and Clay, you have one answer. If you're descended from Chal, Motes, and Adam, you have a completely different answer. Frank Smith, who was one of the allies of Ken Goodman, famously said, reading without guessing is not reading at all. Reggie Routman, as recently as 1988, said effective readers use all three queuing systems independently. Ineffective readers tend to rely too heavily on graphophonic cues. So the, the association, there's no data for this, but this marketing decision that says relying on graphophonic cues leads to poor readers. Ken Goodman, skill in reading involves not greater precision, but more accurate first guesses based on better sampling techniques, greater control over language. Skill in reading involves not greater precision. 
Accuracy, also from Goodman. Correctly naming or identifying each word or part in a graphic sequence is not necessary for effective reading since the reader can get the meaning without accurate word identification. Furthermore, how many people who teach the three cues, how many people who teach according to reading recovery, the Founders and Pinnell, or, Lee, or, um, or Calkins, understand that at the foundation of their way of teaching is the belief that accurately identifying words is not important. That being unable to accurately identify words isn't something we need to worry about. All readers from, this is from Clay in 1998, published in the Auckland, New Zealand version of the observational survey or different versions for all over the world. As you can see, they need to use the meaning, the sentence structure, order cues, size cues, special features, special knowledge, first and last letter knowledge before they resort to left to right sounding out of chunks or letter clusters or in the last resort, single letters. How many of you have seen Worksheets where kids are asked to match up letters with boxes that are tall and short and go below the line that show the general shape of a word, the general shape of letters, and figure out which word most fits that pattern and write those letters in their boxes. The teachers who hand those out do not understand that that comes directly from this, that comes directly from the belief of Mari Clay and others that kids use the general shape of a word to identify a word before they attend to the actual letters. We know that's absolutely untrue, but that's why we do it. People don't know why they do what they do. This is a quote from a guy from, from Australia as recently as 2007. He said that whole language is still lit with us, and part of the way they kept us with us is by shifting over to the term literacy. Remember when reading was reading? Now it's literacy. That's a word game. That's a, that's a shell game as we try to move it around so that people can't keep up with it. We're gonna get these handouts to people. This is a place that you can find some other quotes and facts about whole language, that if you don't like whole language, it's very entertaining. If you do think you like whole language, it'll drive you crazy. Um, compiled by Carrie Hempenstahl. But we have to recognize that for most of us, we are in one camp or another because of others, because of other colleagues, professors, friends, who we took a class from. You do not believe what you believe because you have systematically gone through the science. I do not believe, magically believe what I believe. We all stand on the shoulders of others. We rely on what others have taught us to be true. If you're trusting in what I'm teaching you is true, I'm trusting that what Louisa Motes taught me was true. I believe it is and I believe it's consistent, but other people are doing the same thing. They're just relying on the wrong people. And not relying on those people is difficult. Shifting who you rely on is a very, very difficult thing. We will all filter and understand what we do. I have some information here about Massachusetts, Florida, and Wisconsin. Let me go through this very, very quickly. We're almost done. What this shows is that Massachusetts has made gains over time. DC has made gains over time. Florida has maintained gains over time. Wisconsin did not gain. This is on the NAEP. The reason for that is because of the way we teach and the priorities we made in these different places. Now you think those differences don't look that big, but this is what happened to their rankings in Wisconsin for third grade reading on the NAEP over time. Wisconsin used to be ranked near the top. When we failed to follow the science of reading, we plummeted. We plummeted. Uh, our, our ranking continues to struggle. Um, we actually rank behind Mississippi now because we are so resistant to the science of reading. Does anybody have any questions? We had one question. Um, I'm curious why no one talks about project follow through. Project follow through, that was, was that the, um, as I recall, that was the large scale study that was done through Head Start centers, I it, believe. Yeah, it says, um, beginning in 1968, under the sponsorship of the federal government, it was charged with determining the best way of teaching at-risk children from kindergarten through grade three. Um, had a lot to do with direct instruction. 
it, that question came up when you were talking about the yeah the, and you know profit yeah. follow through is is very similar in finding it asks different questions than what I'm looking at really part of the problem with project follow through is you know if phonics and phonological instruction is controversial direct instruction scripted direct instruction is wildly controversial and applying project follow through to what we do now is a little challenging because one of and again this is what people believe and there's some data for it is that direct instruction is the best way for people not trained in science, the science of reading to teach effective reading but if you're well trained in the science of reading we believe you can probably do a little bit better in many cases than scripted direct instruction the best teachers know when to be scripted and know when to go off script and that takes deep deep knowledge knowledge i don't have but i hope all of you have a chance to get so dr dykstra we're about four o'clock here um, right. you, have, you have a few more slides because we do have some other questions and i'm wondering um if it would be okay if those people would uh follow up with you by email they can follow up with me by email that was a race through the, the end of it yeah. right there i'd be happy to answer their questions um let me say this I cannot tell you how much respect I have for the people, mostly women, who have the courage under very difficult circumstances and not often with shoddy pay um, and the decreasing respect in our society to stand in front of a room full of students and try to teach kids who are very, very different from each other at very, very different points along the learning curve to read, to do math, to get along with each other, to be better people what you do for them, the relationships you form with them. I'm gonna tell you something right now. Out in my car, I have, and in my garage, I have more pieces. I have about seven or eight pieces of the chalkboard from my sixth grade elementary school classroom because the teacher in that class touched me so deeply that when that school was torn down, I went to the school and took the chalkboard, the metal chalkboard off the wall, had it cut into pieces. And everybody I know from that class wants a piece. Teachers touch our lives so deeply that when that man died a few years ago, all across the United States, if that information was spread across the social media, men and women in their mid to late 50s stopped where they were and wept openly. Because that's how much teachers touch us. That's how much you touch the lives of your children. That's how much love and respect they have for what you do. And if anybody sends me questions, I'll do everything in my power to answer them because you deserve them. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we want to thank Dr. Dykstra today and all of you who attended the session and you know the work that you do every day for the benefit of kids. Um, this session was recorded and will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the future. The Patent Literacy team will also be creating supports aligned to these presentations at the symposium to maximize the learning for families and educators. 